Bienvenidos a Disrupt Everything, podcast series by Isla García. Reinventate a ti mismo y cambia lo que más te importa. We can and must heal the soul want that mark us all. This is a quote that really impact, impacted me from our next guest, our next disruptor. Trauma is a part of us that we cannot neglect, but this doesn't mean that we are flawed. It is just, we had to go through it. It's a part of our exist existence, part of the I, me, my. We need to acknowledge this in order to progress, strive and disrupt ourselves. Then insights come from our intuition, wisdom, comes from seeing the world as it is. Science helps us to put both in practice to discover new horizons. And science starts within. This is key for living in a permanent state of reinvention. That's the mission of this podcast, opening ourselves to the possibility, being that, that Leonardo da Vinci in modern lives, learning how to truly live this journey called life. And so, for helping us broaden our sight and insights, we have a new disruptor, a new master of life, a new master of healing trauma, a new wise man, an inner scientific, Thomas Hubble. Thomas, welcome to Disrupt Everything podcast series. Oh, thank you, Israel. I'm so happy to be here with you today. Thank you. Same here, Thomas. And now we're gonna jump to the intro. And then we go with Quiz Thomas and the questions. Disrupt everything. Explora los márgenes o muere intentándolo. The deepest listening is presence, is consciousness itself, its space, an open heart, compassion, and a deep receiving of someone. This is also a quote from. Thomas Howell, which I found in his website and really, really inspired me to, to put it in the, as a presentation for, for Thomas. He worked in po Pocket Project, an academy of inner, inner science. He's teacher, author, and founder. Thomas Hubble is a teacher, author, and founder of the Academy of Inner Science and a Pocket Project, as I said. He's teaching integrates the core insight of the great wisdom traditions with the discoveries of contemporary science. He has worked with tens of thousands of people worldwide, tens of thousands of people worldwide through workshops, multi-year training programs, and online courses. His work combines somatic awareness practices, advanced meditative practices, and transformational processes that address individual and collective trauma. Thomas has guided large scale healing events that have brought together thousands of Germans and Israelis to acknowledge, face and heal the cultural shadow left by the Holocaust. That's powerful. His new book is called Healing Collective Trauma. This, I guess, is being published. It was in November of 2020. You can find uh, Thomas in thomashubel.com, in pocketproject.org, and in thomashubel.com. Thomas, welcome again to Disrupt Everything podcast series. Mm, thank you, Isra. It's great to be here. <laughs> so after reading your bio, researching, so I am, I'm, I'm really amazed at the, the work you do for 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 bringing people together and, and making a positive impact and, and creating that change that matters. First of all, congratulations and thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to be doing that. And, and how, did you, how did you get started in this career? What were your top milestones and life-changing experiences that brought you here and now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a beautiful question. I think there are a few milestones. Um, 
One was that I'm I have been born in Austria, Vienna, and in a time where my you know my grandparents were did experience the Second World War. Um, I grew up in a society that, on the one hand, was a, a kind of protected society in Austria, also privileged society, but on the other hand, I I felt from a certain age on that you know that there wasn't a real opening of what had happened in the Second World War and the Holocaust in Austria. So this was one thing, and hearing from my grandfather about the war and feeling the quality that this left, like the scars that it left, like was definitely one milestone. The other one was that when I was 16, I started to volunteer for the Red Cross as a paramedic and I learned a lot through, you know, I did this for nine years. And when I was 19, I started to study medicine. Um, and, and as a paramedic, I learned so much about so many different walks of lives. You know, I've seen so many things because I did it quite intensively uh, as a volunteer. And um, so I learned a lot about life, about trauma, about many you know, many ways we can get traumatized in our lives. And then, and then while I was studying, I, at the beginning, I really loved my studies. And after four or five years, I felt I such a strong pull to, um, that I, like I started meditating when I was 19. And I did a lot of workshops, reading, yoga, all kinds of stuff. But then when I, uh, I think uh, around 26, I, I felt I have to go to, a, to sit and meditate. And it was very strong, so I did that, and it turned out to be four years. <laughs> and um, like I was, that was definitely also a milestone for me that the a deep inner journey, a calling to explore, like in many, many hours of meditation, my own inner world, you know, the more collective inner world, the higher states of consciousness. I was really deeply immersed in that. And of course, my environment, also my parents, they were also concerned at that time, like, why did I leave everything? Uh, and and I always said, like, I have to go to study in a different way. I have to study from inside. And I loved science and I loved medicine. It was very hard for me to make that step on the one hand. But it was amazing. And like I learned again so much. Um, and when I came back, I was around 30. Um, I, um, through like life invited me to, to start to teach. And so I started with my workshops. And then after you know, a short time, my workshops grew pretty much and became late larger groups and larger workshops and and then i think the next step that happened i wasn't really looking at the time i was teaching you know meditation relational practices self-development uh, deeper inner kind of developmental processes and i developed a lot of new exercises and ways to do that and and in my groups and there are many of the groups at the beginning were in the German speaking area in Europe. Um, it started at one time, like there was this big eruption of the Holocaust, like people, 40 people immediately, like at once started to cry and like see strong images from the Holocaust, have strong emotions come up. And it was a real big thing, you know, within a week long wow. retreat. And and so we worked on this for three, four days. And then and then it kept happening again and again, just with different people, but the same thing. And then I thought, wow, so life shows me something here. And of course, I've learned a lot about energetic perception. And I also my meditation practice showed me a lot also about like collective awareness and collective sensing. And that was certainly also part why it started to happen in my groups. Um, and and then I learned so much. I mean, this is now almost 20 years I'm doing this work. And then we expanded this, you know, from from, from the German-speaking area then to, to Israel because my wife is Israeli. 
and um, and we worked on the German Jewish like Jewish people from from all around the world, but also from Israel. And then we worked on the East West separation in Europe. Um, and then we expanded basically in, into other places in the world. And and so through the groups, I learned a lot about the collective unconscious and about about uh, like like what I wrote in the book. Maybe we'll go into this a bit later. What is collective mm -hmm. trauma and why do I think it's so important? Oh. And what what have been what have been the biggest lessons you take from being as a being a facilitator? On collective trauma, on on collective awareness, on bringing these people together. What have been your that, those biggest lessons for you? Some of the biggest lessons are that that I, I I started to understand that we are, you know, we are living in a world where we don't know often that we have been born into thousands of years of development of life and thousands of years of human traumatization. There's so much trauma that happened between people, countries, ethnicities, you know, like er there are so many big scars. So when you look at the planet from like the overview effect from outer space, you see this beautiful blue planet, but you don't see how many scars it has, you know, something like the Holocaust like the Holocaust, racism in the world, like uh, all kinds of dictatorships, wars, like uh, slavery in general all around the world for thousands of years. Like there are, or the, even between genders, there's so many deep wounds. And those wounds, you know, are like an invisible trauma layer that create a lot of symptoms, but you know, we, I often say collective trauma is like you live in an apartment your entire life. You have never gone out of your apartment. One day somebody vis visits you and says, Hey, Isra, how, how, is your, how does the house look like that your apartment is in? And you say, I don't know. You can only guess how it looks like, but you have never seen it from outside. And so <laughs> we all have been born into a world that is traumatized already. So we grew up in trauma that is a systemic effect, not just a personal experience. It's a personal experience for many people that is very painful. But there is a whole network of trauma that is very old. And so I learned a lot about, you know, that we are all together in an invisible trauma field that creates parts of the structures of the societies, parts of our language, the ways we interact with each other, the ways culture works, the ways, you know, we treat each other. And, and also one of the deepest trauma symptoms is separation. Separation, othering, fragmentation, polarization. And so as a facilitator, I learned a lot how you know, step by step, we need to be able to listen to life and to learn from life every moment, because um, only when we do that can we reveal what by its nature we cannot see. And so I think that's one, and the humility to constantly be in a learning process, like that as a facilitator, we are always learning new things. And we need to be willing to go into discomfort together in order to induce some healing. And maybe the last part is how important is presence and human relation, like authentic human relation is very important for any kind of healing work. Uh, what, are, what are the, what are this, what is this? Uh, what what have you? What have you? Yeah. What this healing bro has brought you? So, what have you experienced through healing, through your own healing to others, or through your through your own healing to you? Yeah, through my own healing, like I think our all of our journey is to find out what are the parts in our lives that we don't want to look at, that we avoid to look at, that we, you know, drag with us and repeat constantly, and um, and how to find ways to have a deeper 
Still with honesty, a deeper relation to ourselves, more presencing, use the right practices, have the right support around us. But whenever I say like trauma is always creating a fragmentation in the nervous system. So it's a splitting. One part is very stressed, another part is very numb. So we can't feel ourselves. And on the other hand, we feel very stressed. And so my own healing is that I feel that every time I healed or heal something in myself, I become fuller, I become um, more grounded, more expressed and more related. I start seeing things that I couldn't see before and I become more alive and at the same time I'm also more centered. So through my own healing journey that um, that I started already when I was 19, I um, I think that's, that's my learning. And every healing comes with what I call post-traumatic learning. We always learn something new and we can include more of life, other people's perspectives, where they come from, what are the symptoms and what is actually the root of those symptoms. And in the collective healing, I've been, you know, I've sat in so many workshops, I've sat with people that are, you know, the children of Nazi uh, soldiers together in the room with people who survived the Holocaust or uh, the children of Holocaust survivors in concentration camps. And when we sit in these rooms, like there is such a powerful like pain and also possibility in the room. And I often describe this, that in this collective trauma healing processes, we can really start to feel the end of the conscious universe. Like we, we start to feel that we reach the end of what we can feel and sense together. And, and I think when we can stay in these places in an appropriate way, there is always like a deeper healing. And I have seen people that, you know, are coming from very opposite directions of perpetrations, of hurt, of crimes, basically, are and are willing to look at this as the descendants of, of, of that strong polarization, that there are fundamental fundamental healing processes happening uh, in, in, in a room that is present where we also, as large groups, are able to witness each other. Because I think many things need to be witnessed. Like a child that has been traumatized needs to be seen as that. Uh, like somebody who has been traumatized through racism, it needs to be acknowledged, it needs to be seen, it needs to be felt by somebody so that that there is a real honoring of what happened, so it can release the stagnation of the pain slowly. So we actually have the power as human beings to see each other in the places where we by ourselves almost cannot look. And, and I think there is a power in this collective witnessing, like a connected, uh, vulnerable witnessing, um, that, that brings wholeness. And I think when we look into our world, we see a lot of fragmentation and polarization. And I think what we need, what we can bring also is to bring more wholeness and, and connection into our world and relation. Amen. Amen. Wow, that's super powerful. There is a power in collective witnessing that brings wholeness. And, um, and um, what you say, the child that's been traumatized has to be seen as it is. That's really, really powerful. Thomas, what are the most powerful core insights of the great traditions that you have learned? Yeah, I think one is that whenever <clears throat> we, we are on a path of wisdom or upgrading the what kind of human being we are, how we make choices, the ethical choices that we take in life, the, you know, the, the depth of our consciousness and awareness and so on. <clears throat> One is humility. Like that I know 
that when I'm looking for like awakening or the divine or light in my life, like conscious awareness is light, I, I need to be able to receive that as a blessing. And it's not just like a personal mission, like running a marathon and who is faster will get there. It's not a career. It's not, um, it's, it's being willing to really walk my life and accept my life and also be able to change my life from inside out. And so that's one. The other one is the power of presence. Also the initial quote that you brought that, you know, the deepest listening is presence, is consciousness. Like when we, when we deeply listen to each other, but listening is much more mystical. Listening is, is a very powerful witnessing. I can become aware of my own body sensations, of my emotions, of my thinking, of my interactions, my patterns, my behaviors. I can become aware of the collective patterns and behaviors and, and so on. But when we, when we are really, like as human beings, truly interested in each other and we want to find out with each other more about life, there is always a blessing and a beauty to this. And it doesn't matter if we have very painful moments together or if we have very innovative and, you know, creative moments together. There is something about the togetherness, I think, that shows us that we are all part of a fabric of life. And the interdependence within that fabric of life, that we are all connected, because the air in my lungs that I use right now to say the words that I'm saying is produced by the trees around where I live and in, on the whole planet. And without those trees, no words. So there is always interbeing or interdependence. And, and I think the more we see that, like how you feel really matters for me because we are connected. And so to create a deep care and a compassion for not only what I experience in life, but also what you experience in life and be able to, or what we experience in life. I think these are all essential teachings of, I mean, I could go on much more, but I don't want to make the answers too long. So that's why these are just a few core elements, uh, how presence, relatedness, care, generosity, and uh, relation are very deep aspects of like living an embodied spirituality, not one that wants to bypass life, you know, to get out of here, but one that helps us to get into here. And, and how can we be more compassionate with ourselves first and then with others? That's part of also the trauma, right? Right. Yeah, I think that's a beautiful question. I think that First of all, we need presence. I first need to be aware that I'm not compassionate with myself because sometimes <laughs> our habits, how we, you know, criticize ourselves, how we don't want the parts of us that are weaker or that we judge as weaker, how we, you know, are self-critical or even dislike ourselves, our bodies, our emotions, our, you know, thoughts. There, like, there's an awareness needed. But once I have more awareness, that I for myself, but I believe it's also something we have to change as a culture. I often say every weakness that I might see today as a grown-up person in myself is a childhood hero. That's the function that I needed as a child in order to protect myself. So, for example, if somebody... If a child, if children are, are being neglected and the parents don't take care of them properly, they live in a lot of stress and fear, especially when they're very young. So for a child that is constantly super stressed and scared, it's very important to shut that fear down, to pull the awareness out of the body in order to create some inner, you know, coherence and inner peace. But later on, as a grown-up, that person might be insecure. It might take the person longer time to take decisions. The person might not feel his or her body so well. The person might be often scared. But we can say that these are weaknesses, or we can say 
the the child did its best it used its intelligence to create those defense mechanisms they are not weaknesses they are misunderstood strengths and and then today in many business settings we have assessment tools you know israel what are your strengths tell me your strengths and then tell me your weakness and i think that those tools are not any more timely because i think we need a bigger perspective what those weaknesses really do for us and the other part is also that you know all like the things that we often call dysfunctions in ourselves that i'm not able to do something that i'm shy to relate to other people that i'm you know that i feel isolated or separated or that i often feel ashamed or or guilty or self judgment those are symptoms of deeper trauma and and still in our society people think oh if i have trauma i'm not so good but then we find out that most of the people carry some trauma and it's just a question what do we do out of it it's not a stigmatization it's a it's part of life we all have been born into a traumatized world some of us more and some of us a bit less and and so to to understand that um that we are we are creating there are some people that are experts in working with people or groups on trauma you know they need to have a lot of knowledge how to do that and a lot of skill but our societies i believe need to be more trauma informed that we start to see that certain thing when somebody is reactive and gets angry at me maybe the person is just very scared and i might take that anger as an offense as an attack i take it personal and then with that person i am already creating a distance because i don't understand what's happening but if i have just a simple knowledge like the first aid you know when you do a driver's license you learn to do the the basic first aid and i think we need a <laughs> basic trauma information for every citizen because then the whole society and the collective will start to see those symptoms more and i think that would be very helpful because many many trauma symptoms are being uh misunderstood and we take them as personal offenses or a person doesn't like me or a person is a distant when in fact the person is just distant because you know as a i don't know as a boy in school the he or she has been bullied and now that's the protection and i don't i feel strange with that and because i don't understand that so there are many things What? i think how we can be more trauma sensitive and so much what are what are those or the most common or biggest symptoms from trauma yeah. that we can relate or we can identify in ourselves yeah the most um i think trauma comes imagine i i i i will tell you an analogy i think that it illust illustrates it the best let's say there is a tv in your living room mm -hmm. and you watch a movie and the movie shows you a scene in a war and when you look at the movie and it's noisy it's loud it's fighting and then you take your remote control and you mute the tv and then you see still the scene is playing the movie is still playing but you don't hear anything and then you take the tv off the wall and you throw it into the ocean and in the ocean it slowly this it's still playing let's say the tv is still playing and it disappears at a certain point in the dark and it drops onto the ground of the ocean and so you know after like big catastrophes like wars or the holocaust or something like this there are millions of tvs on the bottom of the ocean the collective unconscious they are still playing but we don't see it start but it's still going on the war scene there and that's how we need to understand trauma it's like when i experience something that is deeply overwhelming and for a child many more simple things are deeply overwhelming than for a grown up person sometimes so when i experience something that's deeply overwhelming 
it overloads. It's like a computer that gets overloaded. And my nervous system has an amazingly intelligent mechanism, the trauma response. And it, it, because I'm very stressed in that moment and I can take uh, like the part that is overloaded, shut it down. Like it's like the nervous system goes dark in these places. The sensitivity is going out. So I don't feel the pain that is in that part anymore so that I can survive better, that I can, you know, stay and do actions. But one part of me is already frozen. Mm -hmm. And so that we have two elements. We have a lot of stress and that creates hyperreactivity. So when people become very reactive, you know, somebody says something and then the other person starts to yell or shout or be very angry or be very scared. There's a lot of stress and very strong emotions that do not fit to the situation. They're too much. That's a sign of trauma. And the other sign of trauma that some people are, we are numb. When we are traumatized, we can't feel. So I can feel you where I'm traumatized. And you can't feel me where you are traumatized. So there is no relation on this place. Other places, we can feel each other. And, and often in intimate relationships between parents and children, in our workplaces, with other cultures and, uh, and, you know, with people from different ethnical backgrounds, like there might be trauma layers where we simply cannot feel each other. So we cannot feel what the other person needs or wants or where she is coming from. So numbness, indifference, non-participation, and, um, you know, a sense of that I don't care are the, and separation, that I feel separate, that I feel alone, that I feel isolated, are also trauma signs. So either I'm very reactive or I'm, I appear very indifferent and distant. And so um, out of those, there are many more secondary trauma signs like addictions and addiction to technology or substances or or also cult in culture racism or um strong othering or fra political fragmentation like also in spain you know what happens uh, between yeah. uh, madrid and, and barcelona this is a very a, a typical trauma fragmentation it's like a, a broken glass like trauma is like you take a stone and you throw it in a window and then you have cracks. That's how our nervous systems look like when we are traumatized. Oh, very interesting. Thomas, how can we... So one of the parts that really intrigued me and also like grab my attention is also the use of mysticism in, in, in all of this. How can you use mysticism in our everyday life, Thomas? Yeah. First of all, maybe we need to define Clarify. mysticism. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because maybe many people understand different things. So when I speak about mysticism, I speak about like all the great yogis in caves in the Himalayas, all the great rabbis, all the great uh, Christian saints, all the, you know, Tibetan masters, all the the really true shamans, all the people that studied through introspection and through a lot of knowledge that often has been passed on over thousands of years, you know, Taoists in the Chinese mountains, uh, Buddhi Buddhist practitioners, like Sufi teachers. And so when we, <clears throat> when we look at the, the essence in the wisdom tradition, not necessarily the religious um, cultural framework, but inside there's something that I call like a flame. There's a fire, a mystical fire. And in, in healthy traditions, that fire has been passed on from generation to generation, often for thousands of years. So there's a deep, there's knowledge, mystical knowledge, and then there's the mystical practice that gives us access to deeper or higher states of consciousness that are not part of our, let's say, daily life experience. And so it's like 
I, that's why I call it inner science. That's why I call our academy the Academy of Inner Science, because I believe through introspection and contemplation and internal experimentation or experiments, you can get access in yourself to states of consciousness that you most of the people don't have access to in when they don't practice this. It's like when you never play soccer, you will not play for Barcelona. Because mm. you don't train, you know, you need to train. And it's like mystical practice is also, there is a training needed and there is a lot of humility needed. And so when, when our nervous system gets trained in that way, it opens up abilities and functions that are sleeping in other states of consciousness. They start to become more awake when we when we practice those because we usually don't use some functions that we have and so the inner science i believe can add to outer science that's why i love the two together also in my book i wrote like a pendulum between science and inner science because science gives us a lot of access to what neuroscience says what trauma science says you know and how it affects our lives and the inner science gives us the practices and the tools and the mindfulness and the meditations, the contemplations, but also a much bigger spiritual context to resource our trauma work. And, and that's why I believe both together are fantastic. And also that, you know, spirituality is often about not just about extraordinary states of consciousness, but it's like the ethical way how we live and walk our life. And, and I think through trauma healing, there is PTSD, post-traumatic stress, and then there is deeper integration. But at the base, usually there is like an ethical question. You know, if a, if a parent beats a child, there's a hurt. If the parent doesn't say sorry, there is no reconciliation. If somebody hurts somebody on the street, if somebody is racist, if somebody is, um, it is, is hurting other people, and it's not being restored, the trauma and the ethical learning doesn't happen. You know, after the Holocaust, there's a lot of ethical restoration needed in order to resolve the original reason why it even happened so trauma healing i think when we go really deep ends up in an ethical upgrade so we become better people and the spiritual practice this part of the spiritual practice i think is very important because restoration would mean the restoration of nations you know in, in like Madrid and Barcelona, there's a restoration needed. If not, then it will break open again and again because the deeper pain that makes it break open again and again hasn't been yet uh, acknowledged. It, the dignity hasn't been restored. And then we cannot just put the Band-Aid on top of it and say, okay, now we leave it and now it needs to work. It won't work. It will come up again and again and again. That's trauma repetition. And... Um, so I believe if we look at the big impact that we have in the world, that there is a lot of learning uh, that is bound in the frozen energy because trauma is like frozen ice. And when it melts, it, gives, uh, it allows life to, to move again. And I often say, maybe one last thing, I often say, you know, when, you, when snowflakes in the winter drop into a river, into the water, they become water. But if snowflakes land on ice over rivers, they pile up. So suddenly you have a meter of snow on the river ice. And that's the same in life. When we don't take care of the old trauma, new experiences add new trauma to it. So the COVID, like the... Uh, COVID crisis right now, the global pandemic, yes. adds a lot of snow on the ice that was underneath. And the reason why we, it's so hard for us to collaborate globally is because there's so much fragmentation in the world that creates a lot of sand in the engine, and then it becomes a crisis. So I think 
unresolved trauma makes it much harder for us to meet challenges like COVID or even climate change. So we all have traumas. How can we start a process of releasing and curing them? Yeah. First of all, that we recognize that we do have traumas or many of us have, as I said, some of us much more strongly and some of us less. That's a big trauma, step, yeah. right? Recognizing it. Recognizing it and not seeing it is, as, a, as something that I shouldn't have, but something that is you know, that holds a lot of learning for me. When I, when I release my trauma, I grow as a human being. I become more alive. I become more engaged. I become more related. Things start to flow better in my life. There are many positive things that happen. I will have more energy available. I'm more creative. There are many, many positive aspects. So recognizing, I often say it's, Trauma healing restores the right to be. Like human rights are composed out of the right to be, the right to become, and the right to belong. Like being means to be in life, but also means like being as a state of consciousness presence. And it also means the state of our nervous system when we can digest our experience and integrate it. And integrated experience is learning. Now, we can say when there is trauma, we need reflection and awareness, one point. So I need to become aware that I am traumatized. The second is to digest it. To digest it either alone or to, to digest it most uh, often we need somebody or a group of people to do it together in relation. And then integrate it. And digestion means, because trauma means, what I said before, when we are split inside, we need to, to unify that again. And if we don't, then it stays in our life and it creates symptoms. And um, so digesting the trauma is giving our nervous system the possibility to, to integrate what was so hard at that time in our life. And, um, and then when we, um, when we, when, I can do this by myself through self-reflection, but often, and Steve Porges, uh, a beautiful man and neuroscientist in the States, you know, put this beautifully in his, in a, he calls it the polyvagal theory. He says that our, my, let's say my nervous system, where is my heart in the chest, there is a branch of my parasympathetic nervous system. That's the part that can put my nervous system into relaxation mode. So when we are very active and then we are coming home and then we relax at home, that part of my nervous system can take stress down and feel more relaxed. When I'm more relaxed, I can reflect about my life. I can meditate. I can uh, digest what I experienced during the day, the things that were beautiful, the things that were hard, and I can use the reflection as a learning. But the other part is that this part in my, this branch of the vagal nervous system is like a USB plug. So when, for, I often bring one example that shows it beautifully. Like, let's say a father is with the child. And the child comes, Daddy, Daddy, I'm scared, I'm scared. And then there are two possibilities how to interact with the child. One is, oh, don't be scared, there is no danger. And so what did I do? I devalued my child's fear. I gave my child that came clearly with an emotional request. I gave my child a rational answer. And I created some emotional distance. The other option is that when, when the, she comes and says, Daddy, Daddy, I'm scared. And then I turn to my child. I feel my child. And when I, the, the core of relation is I feel you and I feel you how you feel me. I feel you feeling me. That's the basic building block of human relation. And... So when I turn to my child and I say, oh, I feel you are scared, come to me. I embrace my child and then I say, okay, let's have a look together what happened. 
So what did I do here? I created emotional resonance. I said, I feel that you are scared. I value the emotion of my child. Yes, you are scared. Come to me means I give you a protected space. And then I said, okay, let's have a look together what happened. I give you parental orientation, leadership, guidance. Let's look. I will look with you together. The second part needs more relational investment, but it creates a feeling for my child that the part in my chest is the USB plug that my child can plug into. And then there is something that's called co-regulation. That the nervous system of one person can support the nervous system of another person to co-regulate stress and to relax. And that's super important for parents, but that's also important for leaders in organizations. When let's say an employee is, is agitated or stressed, I can I can treat the person with rational arguments or I can first acknowledge the emotional need. And then once we are more regulated, we can look at uh, what's really needed and how to solve the problem. But if we try to solve the problem and somebody is agitated, anyway, it will not work so well. So co-regulation between two people in groups is very important. So there's the work that I can do with myself, reflect, digest, integrate. Is the work we can do through co-regulation together and also through maybe trained therapists. And then when we come together as groups, we can heal, especially also collective trauma, mainly in bigger groups where we all do the co-regulation together. And that becomes a very powerful um, environment for integration and healing. Thank you for this detailed explanation, Thomas. What have you, what have you learned from reading the collective trauma, the book, and how can we all benefit from it? Yeah, what I've learned is, like, I put my experience of the last twenty years of running many, many groups around the world. I, I, I wrote down. What I have learned, I wrote down, like I connected it to certain research, science research, and people that do great work, in my opinion, around trauma. And I, I quoted, you know, many people in the book. I collaborated with some other people that their essays or writings are in the book as well, like Otto Sharma or Christina Bethel and others. And, um, and, you know, writing a book is also takes a lot of energy. It's it's a work. You need to form like form the knowledge into like a readable um, material. And what I I wanted on the one hand to show okay what is trauma and collective trauma. I wanted to show how we design the process that how we can work on such things. Um, when there are collective fractures or fragmentations or big divides in a country, in a culture, and so on. And, and I wanted to show how many systems show signs of severe collective trauma, like our education system, our medical system and healthcare system, the political systems, the, how we use technology and what happens in social media and um, other platforms and so how trauma and technology are not a good couple together um, and then also I think one very essential point is is how I believe collective trauma is at the root of our climate crisis because trauma creates a lot of disembodiment. I don't feel my body where I'm traumatized. But my body and my ancestors, you know, my this is these are millions of years of life that sit in our bodies right now, in your body and my body. All the life that was before you refined the biocomputer that that you call your body is run and mine too. And we use all the developments of, of all the people that were before us in this conversation now. And 
So my roots actually are roots into the planet. My body is actually a part of the planet. There's water, there's carbon, there are minerals, there are metals, there's all kinds of stuff, proteins, and that planet. And when we um, when we are traumatized, we don't, we feel separate. We also feel separate from the planet. We feel separate from the biosphere. We feel separate from the feedback mechanisms that we need in order to be in right relation to the biosphere. And the more trauma there is, the the less we feel a part of nature. So we act as like as if we can own nature. And we can consume nature in that way, like through overconsumption. And I think that's why, that's the reason, like that's one reason why we have the climate crisis, but it's also at the base why we respond so slowly to the climate crisis. Because when I'm like, the part of me that wants to evolve anyway evolves, the part of us that wants to learn and grow and expand and develop anyway wants to do this. And then there are habits, like we create structures, organizations, habits in our nervous system and our emotional systems. But those can change if life needs it. I can change my company in order to make it more climate neutral or whatever. But where I'm traumatized, I get afraid of change. I don't want to change. And that's where I think a lot of the climate activism meets a lot of resistance because we don't know that we cannot deal with creating pressure onto trauma. This will just create a counter pressure. And I believe in order to advance the climate conversation faster, we actually need more uh, awareness and skill to heal the collective trauma that is like a, a break or a sand in the engine. You know, it's, it slows down the process. And um, yeah, so I wrote in the book also how how collective trauma affects uh, various of those systems or a healthcare system that you know receives a lot of trauma, hospitals and all kinds of emergency uh, stations. And then at the end of the, I wrote about the vision, you know where we could go if we, if we are able to take care of collective trauma together globally. And so, how is it super interesting? Like what you say, collective trauma is at the root of this climate change. And how did you uh, insightfully link all of this? And so, four is kind of connected with what happened with the Germans, Israeli, and the Holocaust. It's all connected to, through trauma, right? So, right. what what happened when you brought both Germans and Israeli people to work together on healing trauma. Yeah, first of all, of course, we brought the people together that were willing to come together. And, um, you know, we, we always work with larger groups. So there are a few hundred people in the room. And, and, and we invite first everybody that we create a safe environment because I don't believe that we can open something when we are not, when we don't have a certain amount of safety. So we create relational safety, we create some exercises together and some mindfulness and awareness together. And then it creates like a group presence. So we practice a lot this I feel you and how you feel me as the basic building block because that's called neuroception and that's how people create a feeling of safety. So we work with this a lot until we feel safer with each other. And then usually we go through a, a, like steps of a process together where, um, where we learn to listen to each other, to listen to each other's experiences. But since it's collective trauma, usually there's a moment when suddenly a lot of it starts to show up. As I said at the beginning of the conversation, suddenly 40, 50 people started to feel strong emotions and, and so on. So that's why we always have a bigger team of therapists and uh, psychologists or people that are trained facilitators. They are with me in these processes. And um, and then we slowly go deeper and we listen to the various voices and experiences. And 
and it's simply heartbreaking uh, sometimes to you know to hear the depths of what people experienced in the Holocaust or in the war and 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 how we create a deeper listening because through the listening we, we develop intimacy and through the listening we can start to turn towards again because trauma always creates a divide and so there is like a healing happening step by step and usually um you know when we go through such a process it it simply creates an amazing quality of closeness over time even for people that in the past you know were on opposite sides of of a deep perpetration and a deep uh, pain um but they are willing enough to make an, a few steps towards like a restoration and the healing and that's very powerful it's very powerful and it I believe it does a lot for the people in the room, but it's also like a signal or an impulse for our collective field to, even if it's like at the beginning, it looks like slow to come a bit closer. But over time, if this happens more and more and more, then I believe we will induce a bigger movement in the world because frozen life is frozen. It's like a hostage in time. So when the Second World War happened, there's still a lot of energy frozen in 1940 or 1941. Wow. wow. You know, it, it's frozen. It can't move. It's still locked in this time. Because it, that's why I often say integrated history is presence. Unintegrated history is the past. So all the energy and the pain that couldn't be processed in the, during the Holocaust is still frozen in that time. And it doesn't allow life to develop. It's because it's ice. And, uh, and so I believe as groups, we can come together to allow a bit of that ice to melt and to become again fluid, like water, you know, and to move. And like this, we can accelerate the development of our societies. And, the, and also the way we develop global collaboration to deal with climate change. We cannot do this when... A wants to go there, B doesn't want to walk, C wants to look away, D wants just profit. You know, there's so many different, we cannot take care of it, it's too slow. So we need more synchronization, we call this coherence. So the coherence is always the resource to integrate the fragmentation. And we need to learn how to upgrade the coherence in the world, in ourselves. Like coherence is like a data flow. The coherence in my nervous system is a data flow and the coherence between us is our relation and the coherence in a group or in a society is the collective relation. So we need to strengthen all of those. Beautifully said, Thomas. I have two last questions before we jump into the rapid fire questions. Uh, the the first is, would you share with us one or two advanced meditative practices that we can integrate in our daily life? Yes. Um, you want to make it like the guidance now or just to speak about the practice? Yeah, uh, as, as, you, as you feel. No, one practice, for example, <clears throat> is... You know, I spoke before about trauma is usually based on stress. And um, when I feel I'm getting stressed, what I can do is I can focus my awareness onto my breath. Because my breath is one of, one of my oldest friends. You know, from short after my birth, I was breathing throughout my life. Mm -hmm. So breathing is wired in my nervous system on every level of my, when I was one, two, three, ten, twenty, 10, 20, whatever. And so when I feel my breath and I concentrate on my breath, I concentrate on something very essential. And so when I exhale and I slow down my breath a bit, so I, I exhale a bit longer and slower than I would usually do, and I do this a few times. And then 
Whenever I exhale, I follow my exhalation, my out breath, and I feel my body with it. I drop, like it feels like I'm sinking into my body. Then I take another breath, and I exhale, I sink a bit deeper into my body. And that allows me slowly to feel my body more. Then I take another breath, I slow down my exhalation. Then I feel, oh, I'm sinking deeper into the chair, to my sitting. And then I feel, wow, actually, when I pay attention to my body, my body is very alive. Many small movements in my body, streaming sensations, vitality. Maybe in some places I feel my body much more than in others. Maybe there's also a bit of a tension or stress. And I keep on exhaling slowly. And then again, and I feel more and more the aliveness in my body, like the, all these small tiny movements that I usually don't feel, feel so much. And so I can do this for a longer time. I can do this also sometimes just for a minute when I'm in my workplace or when I feel like I got, very, I got a bit stressed. So, and this is called learning self-regulation. I can regulate my nervous system through my body and my breathing. And the second step is when I do this for however much time I have, then I can ask the question, okay, what is aware right now that I feel my body? Because I'm aware that I'm feeling my body, but what is the awareness as such? What is aware of sensations? I'm aware that I feel my body right now. What is aware? Which part of me is aware? Thank you, Thomas. Uh, it's two beautiful techniques we can also apply. Uh, I, I have to do, admit that I was following your guidance and I felt really relaxed. <laughs> I felt like <laughs> everything is slowed down. <laughs> um, beautiful. Uh, Thomas, uh, last, last question before the, ra the rapid fire questions is, uh, what, what are for you the essential tips or principles for creating, for creating a life that thrives? Yeah, first, um, I would say finding out what we are really passionate about, what we, what we want to contribute to the world. Like, what is my creativity, my intelligence, and what, what do I feel motivated to do in the world and to, to ask that question seriously to find out what's my gift and what's my, what's my purpose, maybe. Another one is to create meaningful relations and take care of the meaningful relations, take care to restore them when they get hurt. It's like a maintenance because the social network, and I'm not talking about Facebook, I'm talking about the relations, <laughs> the relations around me are my extended immune system. So I think if we have healthy, honest, and, and authentic relations, it has a very positive effect back onto our health. And it creates systemic health. So creating meaningful relations, finding out what's my purpose in life, and, and seeing where can I generously contribute to life. And am I a participant in, in my intimate relations when I'm a parent, when I'm uh, you know, participating in society? Am I an active participant or am I just like an audience leaning back and trying to consume? And I think the active participation is where we can create a much more meaningful world together. And so this generous contribution to life. And another one is 
to ask myself the question on the one hand, like to practice presence, to be more present where we are and to be really where we are. And the other one is um, like, what's the bigger spiritual context that my life is a part of? Am I here as a separate particle or am I here as part of a much bigger web of life? And, and to explore those questions. I think that's, of course, that's a, in a nutshell, that's very short answer now to a big question. Very, very, very detailed and very also challenging with the questions. So let's jump into the rapid fire questions. Um, it's just uh, really rapid questions with the, I hope right, also for you the rapid answers too. So the book, first one, what's the book we all should read right now? Yeah, one is <laughs> my book, Healing Collective Trauma, I think, and uh, another one is The Tao Te Ching. Oof, amen. I will, I will share both in the, uh, in the podcast show notes. A podcast that has proven valuable to you. If a podcast sorry, that I has didn't proven. Put, sorry, yeah, a podcast that has proven valu valuable to you. Yeah, this podcast has proven valuable to me, and um, I think uh, which other podcast? Sharon Salzberg's podcast has proven valuable to me, like the mindful. Can you repeat, podcast. please? Darren Salzberg's uh, podcast on mindfulness and mindfulness meditations is a beautiful podcast. Do, uh, any documentary or film that you remember the most? Yeah, many. Um, like much earlier, I was fascinated by the movie The Matrix, and recently I saw uh, Life on Our Planet by um, James Attenborough, and I think mm -hmm. that's a very powerful film to see for this time. What's your next project? <laughs> hundreds, <laughs> hundreds. <laughs> uh, if you were to choose one? One, like I'm developing right now, I'm developing a, like in our academy, a, a school for collective trauma integration. A habit or activity you are crazy about? Um, meditating. Mm. It's a good one. <laughs> Uh, a skill you want to master? Skill I want to master. Like throughout my whole life, um, to be able to learn every moment from what I call the book of life, like from the actual experience that is happening right now to deepen my understanding of life out of the book of life, the life book of life. A word to coin what you are? Yeah, mystic. Your best tool? Precise relation. Your biggest failure? My biggest failure. One thing that I'm said about, I don't know if it's my biggest failure, but it's something like it's um, to at that time that I didn't uh, finish my medical studies. I'm st I still feel there's a little bit of sadness about that. Although I think it was at that time the right decision. Was your most amazing success? Hmm. 
that I was able to be part of thousands of people's healing process and um, growth process around the world. Who are the five persons you most interact with? Uh, my wife, my daughter, and um, yeah, my like some of the people that I I work with in my organizations. My personal assistant Ute, one of our leading therapists, Heidi, and um, my personal assistant in Israel, um, Karen. And. Who would you recommend me to interview next? Maybe Otto Sharma. Otto Sharma? Yeah. The theory you process is his work and the Presencing Institute. He works at the MIT um, in Boston. Thank you. Um, Thomas. If you were about to launch the final message to everyone listening to this podcast, what would it be? I feel that there are two ways how we grow as human beings. One is through training and learning and studying and expanding our life and through giving and contributing. And the other one is through to not negate the pain and the difficulties of our shared history, but to be courageous enough to look at them because I think the sentence time will heal our wounds is simply not true because we find out more and more that trauma is cumulative and not uh, just going away by itself, but it needs us to own the actions of our own past and to look at the actions of our ancestors in order to become more whole human beings. And then I think the more we become whole human beings, we will also build a house together for humanity that we all want to live in. Inspiring. Thomas, uh, is there anything else you want to, to add? Yeah, that I thank you, Isra. I think it's fantastic that you're doing this podcast and uh, and I hope that many, many people will be inspired by, you know, your work and what you do and that you go blessed and, uh, and that uh, the contribution that you bring to society will flourish and um, inspire many people. Thank you. And the, fe the feeling is mutual, uh, Thomas. Where people can find you? In the yeah. Internet? thomashubel.com, Hubel is H-U-E-B-L, Thomas H-U-E-B-L.com, uh, the pocketproject.org is our non-profit organization for dealing with collect integrating collective trauma around the world. And um, also Thomas Hubel Online, these are all our online courses that we do, our online academy. Yeah, and uh, in Germany, there's a big festival every year it's called Celebrate Life Festival, celebratelife.info. It's another um, website where you can uh, find my work and also online on YouTube, our YouTube channel. And um, and there is a, the um, collective trauma summit.com. It's our big summit last year we had over 100,000 people participate wow. in the summit with 50 speakers, poets, artists. Uh, it was a great forum. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. Uh, Thomas, two more things before to finish. What will be the question you will ask to the audience? Mm. What is the one relation in your life that you feel inspired to look at and improve or restore? And uh, a final quote to end the podcast. 
the good news is that even if we talked a lot about trauma and collective trauma and it sounds very um, some sounds very hard sometimes or painful the good news is that we are the remedy so collective presence and collective relations are the remedy to heal our wounds thomas thomas thank you so much thank you for being part thank you for what you are gifting to the world and the work you do for healing and and helping people out there is inspiring and um, we are super thrilled and happy to have you in this podcast. Oh, thank you, Israel. It was a beautiful uh, hour and a half and, uh, and thank you for all your inspiring questions and for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much and uh, I leave this to the audience. Follow Thomas' work his courses, his books, his website, participate in his, in his workshops and disrupt yourself. If not, someone will disrupt you. Someone or something will disrupt you. And if it's, it helps you, you can find utility here, share it with just at least one person. And remember to go to your favorite platform and leave a review or share it and subscribe to this episode and the next ones. Thank you for being here. Thank you for choosing, making a move and making the world go. Esto ha sido Disrupt Everything by Isla García. Encuentra el riesgo antes de que el riesgo te encuentre a ti.